Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Now that we're on the home stretch, the summer vacation for many students, I want to talk more about the summer programs available and why they're so important. Keeping kids engaged both during the school year and summer vacation is an essential part of the prevention work that's been a priority for my administration. It's especially important as students are still dealing with the effects of remote learning. Making sure our youth are engaged throughout the summer is one way to help minimize the potential for summer, summer learning loss. Doing so can be as simple as keeping kids reading over the summer, and our state librarian will talk about that in a few minutes. And over the last few years, we've taken steps to grow the number of after school and summer programs available across the state. The after school grant program, which Secretary Saunders will talk more about, helps to create affordable programs using different partnerships to fill the needs of local families. This year, grant awards will support 73 different partnerships and provide a variety of opportunities, including connections for new Americans, peer mentoring, and youth leadership. We also know there are many kids who need support at the kitchen table. That's why I was pleased to announce last week that the USDA has approved Vermont's application for the summer EBT program. This federal program is available to eligible families to purchase groceries during the summer months while schools are closed. And I appreciate the federal government working with us on this. And I'll turn it over to Commissioner Winters to talk more about the program. Thank you, Governor. And although it doesn't feel like it out there today, summer is upon us. As my kids like to remind me every single morning of how many school days they have left. <laughs> so summer vacation will be coming soon uh, for Vermont school children. We're, I'm really excited today that we are able to announce that Vermont is among the first states to launch the new summer electronic benefit transfer program, the yeah, summer EBT, to help feed eligible school aged children during the summer vacation months when school meals aren't available. That benefit is going to be $120 uh, per child for income eligible families. We're estimating that about 45,000 children, which is a little over half of the student population in Vermont, will qualify for this benefit. This brings an estimated $5.4 million in federal funds to the state of Vermont for eligible children, and those benefits are fully federally funded. We couldn't have done this without the incredible collaboration and the above and beyond efforts of the folks in our Economic Services Division in the Department for Children and Families, the Agency of Education, and the Agency of Digital Services. Initially, we were planning to start the program up next year, uh, next summer, given some of the red tape involved with the federal program and some unclear requirements. But the governor made this a priority and dedicated the resources to make this happen sooner. We met with the USDA multiple times over a number of months to find a path forward that meets the intent of the summer EBT program, but also allows Vermont flexibility in this first year of implementation. And as the governor said, our plan was approved uh, just, uh, just last week. This coordinated effort among our agencies and the governor's office is why we're able to celebrate Vermont's participation today as one of the first states to move ahead despite those significant concerns and challenges that we had early on. The extra effort in gaining approval of our SEBT plan has been well spent, resulting in expanded access to healthy meals for children this summer and beyond. Many families will automatically get those benefits if they already get other benefits, but some might need to apply. If your family already receives benefits like three squares, Medicaid, or reach up, you'll automatically be enrolled in the summer EBT program starting in July. The department plans to issue automatic benefits starting July 15th of this year. If your family isn't automatically in, but might be eligible due to meeting income eligibility, which is 185% of the federal poverty level, you'll be able to easily apply online when applications open up in August. So families uh, who apply will receive the benefits as soon as their eligibility has been confirmed in process. Those who will need to apply are those families who meet that income eligibility but are not receiving Medicaid three squares or reach up, 
or are part of the migrant education program and their child attends a Vermont public school or an independent school that participates in the National School Lunch Program. DCF has worked with the Agency of Education to streamline the eligibility process and we encourage families to wait until August before asking about eligibility as most children will receive the benefit automatic automatically. If the child is found eligible, a notice will be mailed to the household. Families who don't have an active EBT card will be mailed one with instructions on how to use it. And EBT cards should be kept because they'll be used each summer for the children who are eligible. The EBT card can be used at grocery stores, farmers markets, and online where EBT is accepted. You can get additional information, including some frequently asked questions and an application which will be available in August at our new summer EBT website, summerebt.vermont.gov. This program will be administered by the food and nutrition team within the Department for Children and Families and a new SEBT unit. You can contact them with any inquiries as well about the program at 1-800-479-6151. There are other summer meal options for children, including summer meal sites where children can eat meals together during the summer, and summer meals to go, an option for rural communities to take home several days worth of meals. Both of these programs are overseen by the Agency of Education, and the Secretary of Education, Zoe Saunders, can speak more about that. Secretary Saunders. Thank you, Commissioner Winters. Um, I'm pleased to share information about summer resources available through the Agency of Education. Along with summer EBT, Vermont once again will offer healthy food for young people at a broad range of open meal sites in Vermont. These sites offer meals to kids 18 and under. No paperwork or registration is required to get a meal. Summer meals are a healthy and convenient option for kids to access meals during the summer months when school is out of session. Families who get summer EBT can also access summer meals. These programs are designed to complement each other to make sure kids have access to healthy foods during the summer months. Participating in one program does not disqualify families from getting the other option. I'm also very excited to share that thanks to some hard work from the Agency of Education, we are expanding access to summer meals this summer through a waiver obtained by the federal government. More than 80 additional Vermont schools are now eligible to provide open sites this year, and we expect many of them to participate. These schools also create an opportunity for any summer program in the area to start a summer meal site representing a very big expansion of summer meal availability in our state. And working in partnership with our friends at the Agency of Human Services, we have engaged in a direct certification through Medicaid, through Medicaid pilot program, which allows us to more effectively identify children who are eligible for free and reduced lunch applications. Direct certification allows us to count these students without the need for families to submit applications. It's giving us better, clearer data and helping us pull down more of the federal funding that is critical to running these programs. Summer meals will start once, summer, once school is out and we are in the process of finalizing the list of open summer meal sites. Soon, Vermont families will be able to find a site near them by calling 211 or visiting fns.usda.gov forward slash summer forward slash site finder. We will also share another announcement within the link once the list of sites has been announced. Secondly, I would like to highlight the importance of keeping children engaged in learning over the summer months and the state's efforts to expand summer enrichment opportunities. I am very excited to announce that this year's after school grant recipients have been selected. The grant, the grant program defines after school broadly and includes summer and weekend activities. 17 grants will be awarded this inaugural year, representing supervisory unions and nonprofits across 11 different counties. These grants are going to support the creation and expansion of after school and, program and summer programs statewide. By leveraging local partnerships and increasing staffing, these efforts will reduce wait lists. Students will receive additional opportunities to focus on career readiness through collaborations with organizations such as the Boys and Girls Club and Vermont Works for Women. New programs will be established to better serve new Americans, English language learners, and students with truancy and academic challenges. Other programs will foster youth leadership and volunteer opportunities, 
allowing for peer mentorship and social emotional learning. These are only a few highlights of the broad range of programs that will be supported by these grants. And I am thrilled to say that they reach every corner of the state, serving previously underserved areas and allowing for further collaboration to not only strengthen student outcomes, but communities as a whole. Later today, we will share more details about the award recipients and the work they are doing to innovate and expand access to out-of-school time programs. This funding builds on our success expanding summer programs during the COVID-19 pandemic and education recovery when we committed over $10 million of federal emergency funds to expand summer learning opportunities. Finally, I would like to highlight some of the great strides we made this session on literacy, working in partnership with the General Assembly. This year, the Agency of Education worked with the Senate and House Education Committees to craft a bill that will ensure Vermont students are learning how to read using the most up-to-date, evidence-based teaching practices and will help teachers identify students who need additional support earlier in their reading journey. I want to thank both committees, most especially Senators Brian Campion and Martine Gulick and Representatives Peter Conlin and Aaron Brady for their leadership on the bill this year. This bill builds on a foundation built by the General Assembly and the Agency of Education in previous years with over $4 million in federal COVID-19 funding dedicated to literacy, professional development, high quality instructional materials, and other resources. Vermont's approach to improving literacy outcomes is innovative and comprehensive. The work ahead will involve a paradigm shift in the way we teach and learn. It will require intensive focus and targeted support. This is about more than just shifting curriculum and changing assessments. We know that many of Vermont schools are already making excellent progress on improving literacy instruction. Our goal is to build on that success and share it statewide so that every student has access to high quality, evidence-based literacy instruction. Working together, we will take a three-pronged approach that focuses on one, early screening and support for students who struggle with reading, two, strong teacher professional development and preparation grounded in the science of reading, and three, using up-to-date evidence-based practices and resources to teach reading. This will be a big effort, but I wanna share my commitment today to Vermont teachers, principals, and administrators. The Agency of Education will actively work to evaluate, elevate, evaluate and support your efforts building on and evolving your existing work and innovation, no matter your starting point. Our goal is to be collaborative and supportive. I wanna take this opportunity to invite teachers and administrators to engage with us as we work together to improve literacy outcomes for Vermont students. Thank you very much. And now I will turn it over to Commissioner Del Neo. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Catherine Del Neo. I'm the State Librarian and the Commissioner of the Department of libraries. Literacy begins at birth. The songs that parents sing, the board books babies chew on and flip through, and the stories that families share all help children learn to read. Our public libraries have a long history of promoting early childhood literacy in our state and support families at the earliest steps on a child's path toward reading. Public libraries provide a treasure trove of children's literature for their communities and support parents and caregivers as they learn to share stories and songs with their kids. Vermont's public libraries provide high interest, age appropriate books for families and host engaging literacy programs like story times and book walks. Public libraries are a free but invaluable resource for our communities. They support emergent readers and help families to prepare their kids for success in school. This session, there has been a lot of focus on literacy, and it really demonstrates Vermont's commitment to building strong readers from the get-go. The bill that, that Secretary Saunders was referring to recognizes the importance of pre-literacy activities and getting books into the hands of every young Vermont child. The addition of a member of the Department of Libraries staff to the Advisory Council on Literacy through that bill will position public libraries in our state to become even more involved in the conversation about how to support our youngest kids as they begin their reading journey. Because having access to books in the home is so important for young learners, the legislature has asked the Department of Libraries to research and report back on successful programs other states have implemented 
so that in Vermont, we might be able to support families with the highest needs and the fewest resources in building home libraries for their children. This bill couldn't come at a better time because summer is approaching. And as everybody knows, public libraries and summer go hand in hand. Right now, public libraries across Vermont are gearing up to host their annual summer reading programs. And this year, our statewide reading theme is Adventure Begins at Your Library. Summer reading programs at libraries are important because reading throughout the summer helps students to maintain the reading skills that they gained during the academic year. Research shows that kids who participate in summer reading programs at their local libraries actually score higher on reading achievement tests at the beginning of the new school year than those who did not participate. Developing a habit of reading is vital to success in school, and visiting the library regularly as a family is a great way to help kids develop that habit. Summer reading programs incentivize frequent library visits and help kids to form a community, of a community of readers, which reinforces how much fun it is to read and to learn. Each time a kid registered for summer reading visits their library, they can report on the number of books they've read or the amount of time they've spent reading, and then they earn prizes. Who doesn't love prizes? And of course, when they're at the library, we know that every kid's going to check out a huge stack of books to take home. But libraries aren't just about books anymore. All across our state, Vermont's public libraries are hosting engaging events for kids and families all summer long, including science, music, craft, reading, and writing programs. I've even heard that there is a public library in our state that is bravely planning a family camp out on its lawn. Community-focused library programs like these help kids to develop a love of reading and a love of learning that they will carry with them throughout their lives. While summer reading programs are often geared towards school-age kids, it's important to remember that no Vermonter is too young to visit their local library. In fact, many public libraries in our state host rhyming and singing programs for kids year-round, who are infants through toddlers and preschool kids. Regular attendance at these book-focused library programs instills a love of reading and learning while exposing kids to pre-literacy activities that set them up for success in school. The Vermont Department of Libraries supports summer reading programs by offering non-competitive grants for youth programming of $300 to every public library in the state. We also provide an online reading challenge platform for folks who would prefer to do some of their badging and, game and, and tracking their reading online, as well as thematic summer reading program materials and training to support librarians. And this year's summer reading theme, Adventure Begins at Your Library, pairs well with another exciting service that the Department of Libraries provides for all Vermonters. Free access to explore the natural beauty, recreational activities, and the rich history of our state through our State Parks and Historic Sites program. Every one of our 187 public libraries in Vermont has received, or will receive in the next week, we just sent them out in the mail, a set of state park and historic site passes that they will circulate to the public. By visiting your library, you can check out one of the passes, and then you and seven of your favorite people can pile into your car and get free admission to a Vermont State Park or historic site. This program has been in place for 15 years and is a collaboration between the Vermont Department of Libraries, the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation, and the, Devar the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. So get ready for summer by visiting your local library to learn about the Summer Reading Club and the great activities they have planned for you. And while you're there, check out a park or historic site pass and, of course, a good book. Now I'm going to turn it back to our governor. Thank you, Catherine. We'll now open up to questions. Governor, as we've talked a lot about this, this session, given the property tax issues, you know, it, it, the cost of education has, is rising. Academic performance has sort of stayed in the middle of the pack. More and more responsibilities are falling on teachers and classrooms for, for uh, human service needs, like uh, you know, nutrition and mental health and things like that. So, given all of these programs that you sort of outlined today, what's your your hope or your confidence level that this is going to help alleviate some of the, the challenges that that we're seeing in schools right now? Well, certainly, uh, the summer programs and after-school programs have been essential, I believe, uh, to making sure that we're protecting our kids, we're educating our kids in a different way, and we're making sure that they have something to do to keep busy, again, after school and during the summer. 
So uh, we've been working on this for a number of years. I'm pleased where we are today. We have a long, still have a long ways to go, um, but we have more opportunities there than we ever have. Um, so I think that's the good news. Um, and I would ask any of the three of you if you'd like to comment a little bit further on that. Is that? <laughs> I had a follow-up, I guess, for Commissioner Winters. Sure. I, I understand that part of the reason we weren't able to participate in the federal food program was because of IT issues, uh, aging computers. Um, we have the waiver this year. What, what's it going to look like in the next few years uh, if, if we, you know, are we going to be able to keep getting this waiver? Just what, what will that look like in the out years? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll be ready for next year. And that was the plan all along, that with enough time, we would be ready for next summer. Um, but what we have in place for this year was really a, a culmination of a, of a lot of effort by a lot of people. Um, so you know, I have, have to say thank you to the Agency of Digital Services and the leadership there um, to kind of drop everything they were doing to make this happen. Uh, the Agency of Education, our folks within DCF. It's a great example of a number of different departments and agencies kind of, you know, forgetting about the, the silos for a minute and working together really hard toward a common goal. Um, and it really is a, a somewhat of a miracle that we got this done so quickly. Um, it's a great example of teamwork and collaboration. And when we do put our, our mind to it and our resources behind it, we can accomplish something like this on on short notice. So we're just really happy that uh, we can provide this benefit to kids this summer, especially for kids who might not otherwise um, have a, a solid meal every single day. This is a way to, to make sure that they are, are being fed. That's $120 week, weekly, monthly? Uh, th it's uh, $120 is the, is the entire benefit for the summer. Commissioner, did I hear you correctly that for the, the kids whose families are not already enrolled in the scores or reach up, what have we, that the application will open in August? That's correct. Okay. Yep. And how long about would it, do you know at this point, how long the application process would take for them to get approved and get the benefit? I'm just thinking about kids go back to school in August. That's right. Um, you know, again, the, the fact that we were able to get this done this summer was somewhat of a minor miracle. Um, and I think, you know, Deputy Commissioner Gray is on the line. I don't know if she can speak to the, uh, the technology that's behind it. I believe it'll be an online application. So I think processing will be fairly quick. That's correct, Commissioner. Um, we, it will be an online application. Um, and I believe we have just, um, I want to say it's 14 days to be able to process the application and we have built that into our process to be able to do that. And just so that everyone understands, this will be an ongoing benefit each summer. And this is just us getting it up and running very quickly this year on short notice. And will there be like any expiration for people to use the benefit by? Miranda, do you know the answer to that? I don't think it um, exactly aligns with our SNAP benefit, so I'm happy to um, follow up with you after to see if we've gotten that clarification of how long. I do want to underscore um, the team uh, work that went into this. And when we first started, as you know, uh, the federal government said, no, uh, your square peg doesn't fit into our round hole, and uh, we don't see any way to make it happen. But, um, but our team didn't give up, and it took um, you know, eight, four different agencies uh, to get it done. And uh, again, that, um, that camaraderie and the team atmosphere was essential in doing that, but I want to give credit where credit's due. The federal government didn't have to do this, but they listened uh, to what uh, we were saying, uh, that we want, We all had the same goal. We wanted to help our kids. Um, we just need to get through the, the process, the red tape, uh, and, uh, and uh, them understanding why it wouldn't work for us and many other states as well. So uh, again, I think we ended up in a good place, but, uh, but it took a lot of work. and. I, uh, I thank my team for that. Governor, speaking of education, I mentioned the property taxes. Do you have any sort of update? I know in the past few weeks you've alluded to, uh, his, his, I, I don't know what to call it, but you, you mentioned that there could be something else in the works from your administration. Do you have any more details to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've made it quite clear that I'm going to veto the bill. And we've reached out to the, the House and the Senate. and. Uh, 
it seems like there are two ways to to get to where I think we need to get to. Um, their way might be uh, to just override my uh, my veto. Uh, that would be one way. Um, the second way is uh, we have an approach. Uh, we have a, a plan, a proposal uh, that we are willing to speak to them about, and we're hopeful that they will uh, they will at least engage with us. Um, they've uh, there's been some outreach and they've they've responded, and I, I believe that we'll be meeting as soon as uh, as soon as I do. I think one body said we'll meet any time. Um, the other body said we'll wait until after you veto the bill. So whichever way uh, we want to get together with them, I'd like to get together with them jointly so we can have a conversation about what our plan looks like. Uh, but um, but beyond that, I think we'll we'll wait until we get to propose it to them first. So you're not prepared to share, share any details no. or high level yeah. what it could look like or how it differs. Again, high future. high level. It's just uh, trying to get to a bridge uh, to more structural reform in the future. Uh, I think we should get there faster because uh, this problem doesn't go away uh, by just paying, you know, impacting property tax payers in a, in a big way this year uh, will not alleviate them from more pain next year. So that's why we need to get to structural reform now. And this will accelerate that, um, providing a bridge uh, to taxpayers this year as well. And um, so, again, it's all those pieces working together. Wait, so would this be like adding on to the yield bill uh, structural reforms or like through separate? Yeah, it would, once you veto a bill uh, of this nature, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, so they would have to be resurrected, but there are plenty of other bills and numbers out there that uh, there are a lot of creative creativity that could be utilized and, uh, and get another bill passed. But it would have to go through the process. But I would, you know, that would only be if they overrode. Um, S58, I think, is also waiting your your signature. Uh, the, that's the raise pausing, raise the age. It has some implications for fentanyl and xylazine drug trafficking, things like that. How, yeah. how, what's what's your read on on that bill? Well, again, the public safety area. Um, there, I think, is one uh, do. Uh, tomorrow, and uh, there's some more due afterwards. Uh, but, but anyhow, we'll, um, that was the bright spot in uh, in this legislative session. We came to agreement in a lot of different areas. We didn't get everything we wanted, um, but it was a step forward, and I think we can all feel good about that. Yesterday, you allowed S two and I into the law without your signature. I guess what was your thought process behind that? Is from your understanding, is that an issue that we're dealing with commonly here in Vermont? That ghost guns are popping up in crimes and things along those lines. Yeah, I, that's that was my point. I don't believe we're seeing that. Uh, um, I believe every gun should be have a serial number attached to it. Uh, that's why I let it go. Uh, but um, but I don't think that is the issue. I think some of the issues we brought up during the session, some of the things we didn't get uh, that we should continue to work on is where we should have put uh, more of our effort. So ghost guns might be important, uh, but uh, but I don't think that's what's impacting uh, some of the what we're seeing across the state. I believe action is coming due soon on overdose prevention sites. Is that still in the Yeah, I mean, uh, I, again, I've been quite clear about that one as well. I think that's due tomorrow as well. So with sticking with drug policy for a second, I think one of the bills also hasn't gotten a lot of attention this, this year, um, the psilocybin bill, um, legalizing, studying uh, the medical or medicinal uses of psychedelic mushrooms. How do you I think that, that I think that one's due tomorrow uh, as well. I, I again, I we haven't been through all the bills. I, in fact, I think there are 21 bills due, <laughs> which is amazing. So uh, Jay will have to go through each and every one. She's in here for a now one hour break over the next 24 hours uh, so she can get back to reading. But um, but barring any any problems uh, associated with the technical aspects of the bill, I expect we'll let that one go. Like let it go in the law without a signature? I haven't, signature? haven't decided at this okay. point. Just haven't looked at it enough. 21 bills is, is a lot to go through and, and we haven't fully contemplated everything uh, in the bills.
All right, we'll move to the phones. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Looks like you're still muted, Ed. All right, uh, we'll move to Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Go ahead, Ed. We can. Looks like you're unmuted now. Okay. Uh, the, the question for the governor, which is, are you familiar with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library program? I am not familiar with it, but I'm sure. Uh, I'm familiar. With yeah. <laughs> Catherine can help us with that. <laughs> hi. Do you have a question yeah, about? Catherine. Hi. Yes. What I was just wondering is, uh, because that program covers all children age uh, from birth to age five, they get a book a month for free, and it's underwritten by uh, different organizations. Um, would you th consider having an arrangement with them to take care of the, the zero to five age population through an existing program? Well, um, there has been legislation proposed twice since um, 2022 when I became the state librarian um, that was specifically around the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Um, it's, it's a great program. Lots of people enjoy it and are already participating in it. What we've been asked by the legislature, what we will be asked to do is to look at all of the various programs that are implemented in the country in this same gift book space um, and look at what's most affordable and sustainable for Vermont. Um, I know that the Dolly Parton <coughs> Imagination Library is a, is a big brand name program and I know that it has a lot of supporters here in Vermont and um, Dolly Parton's a great musician, a great philanthropist, does great work, but we have very limited resources in our state and we're really trying to find out what's the best way to use our limited dollars in the state to support the kids who have the highest need in the communities that have the highest needs. So um, over the summer, I'll be hitting the books and doing a lot of research and checking in with other state librarians and colleagues around the country who have implemented this program that you're talking about, as well as many other programs that have decades of, um, decades of implementation in other states to see what might fit best for us. So I think um, this is a good topic to talk about after that report has been written. I think it's going to be due in January. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, back to the room. I thought Ed was going to ask if you knew who Dolly Parton was. And I wasn't uh, sure where he was going. I could have answered that. <laughs> <laughs> um, tomorrow is the deadline for candidates to file, major party candidates to file with the Secretary of State's office. You've mentioned before that you're trying to recruit down ballot candidates for the legislature. Can you give us an update on how that's going? Yeah, we've made some. Uh, we made some gains. Uh, I expect we'll see some of those candidates filing uh, before uh, before the end of the day tomorrow. Um, not as many as we'd hoped, obviously, but uh, uh, but we'll we'll see what ends up uh, at the end of the day. Do you have a rough, a rough I, estimate? I don't. Okay. okay. So I know that you said some moderate Republicans, some more centrist Democrats and independents too. Can you give us an idea of how many folks would fit those categories? Yeah, I can't I can't give you that right now because I don't know who's actually going to follow through. Okay. Um, a lot of interest, uh, a lot of, but there's a lot of apathy as well. And a lot of folks are busy. Um, we've heard that uh, year after year. And um, so um, we'll see what, what happens by the end of the day. Why apathy? What do you think? Well, it's just that you know it's, it's difficult um, to to move away from your your job, your life, and and uh, give up all the things you have uh, going on. So um, you know, a lot of folks want to do it. They just uh, don't think the timing's right. Well, sometimes the timing's never right, uh, and I use myself as a uh, as a, an example of that. I mean, I did it. 20 something years ago uh, when I didn't have the time either. And um, so I just jumped in because I thought it was that important uh, to have my perspective heard. And I hope that others will do the same. You know, public service is 
rewarding, difficult, but rewarding. And it doesn't have to be forever, but, um, but I think we all have to do our part. You filed, of course, recently for re-election. I mean, do you plan on actively campaigning and putting your message out there? Like yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's important. Doing debates and everything like that? Well, we'll see. We'll see who who uh, steps up. But um, certainly, I've had debates in the past, and we'll have probably debates in the future. Uh, Governor, yesterday you announced um, the grants to fund the transformational tourism initiatives. Um, can you elaborate on what you hope to to accomplish by? Yeah, again, uh, these are grants that are going to be very helpful to the state. Obviously. You know, tourism is one of our industries, so we pay a lot of attention to that, uh, and we need to, to do all we can to promote that and to, to actually leverage all the, uh, the resources we have. I was, uh, I was thinking uh, the other day about you know, where our GDP is, and you know, I think we're last on the list in terms of GDP. Uh, and we, when you look at other states, the big states, they just dwarf us, the Californias, the Texas, the New Yorks. Uh, in terms of GDP. So uh, again, we have a lot of catching up uh, to do and to get from the bottom of the list up mid-pack, which was, would be nice, or we're even being out-competed by uh, other small states. So, so again, it's important that we pay attention to this because that gives us the resources we need uh, to do all the things we want to do just to keep up. Do you want Lindsay? Do you want to comment further on this program? Sure, that's great. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? We can. We can. Uh, yeah, we're really excited about this, um, the announcement of these grants. Um, you know, we really want to enable folks to continue to further, uh, uh, you know, destination tourism events. Um, and really, we're looking for things like brand new events that are designed to attract an out-of-state audience um, or existing events that would expand. Again, we really wanna push out-of-state audiences to come to our state. So, you know, we're looking for folks to really bolster the marketing, get people to come to Vermont. This is an opportunity to really recover after COVID and the flooding. So um, we wanna improve the visitor experience here in Vermont. So go ahead to our website at accd.gov and um, there's a landing page for these T-term uh, grants. And the deadline, I believe, is June 17th. So there's not a lot of time, but uh, really want to. Apply for the, uh, the grants. Governor, I had a, a separate, somewhat related topic. Um, about local option taxes. I think one, of, one bill on your, your desk right now in your hometown of Berlin, they're looking at a yeah. local option tax. There was a, a provision approved by lawmakers um, that allows uh, a number of towns, I think 60 or so towns, to enact local option taxes without a, a charter change, so they'd be able to do it at a town meeting. What's your read on, on, on that situation? Is that right, wrong, what do you think? Well, again, I'm not a big fan of raising any taxes, uh, but, uh, but the, the horse is out of the barn on this one uh, the, a long time ago. Uh, the local options taxes started, I believe, in Williston and uh, expanded from there uh, to many, many different uh, towns and, and cities and so forth. So at this point in time, I believe you know what's fair for one is fair for others, and so we might as well just open it up and let them do what they want. How did you vote on the Berlin local option tax? I probably voted against it. I don't remember for sure, but okay. I would assume I did. I didn't have veto um, over that, though. <laughs> Tomorrow, um, Senator DeMaso's memorial service, celebration of life. I guess just any kind of final words. This is the first time we've been able to ask you about it in person. And um, yeah, I'll that happening tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be, um, I'll be giving uh, the eulogy uh, there tomorrow. I'm honored to do so. Um, obviously a, a tough loss for me personally, uh, but for us as a state as well. But I'm, you know, I'm comforted by the fact that he, um, he's no longer suffering. I, uh, I spoke to him, he called me last Tuesday, Tuesday night, and I could tell uh, that he was out of sorts. Um, 
struggling and um, our conversation was brief. So I decided to rearrange my schedule on Wednesday and uh, I went up to see him. And happy that I did. He was uh, very coherent, witty, uh, funny. Uh, we, uh, we had a great conversation. And, um, but he went downhill quickly from there. And I had the, uh, the parade in, in Essex on Saturday. I uh, had thoughts of maybe going to see him afterwards. But uh, once the parade ended, I uh, checked in. And uh, his daughter had called. And I called her back. And he, she told me he had passed. So again, tough one for all of us. Everybody that we've talked to this, this past week in the Senate and beyond has said, you know, it, it's it's a, a real loss for you know institutional knowledge, but also just like the type of politician that he was, you know, like sort of reaching across the aisle, engaging people as as a as a human. I mean, what what effect do you think that's that's had, you know, over the years on, or what, what effect has he had, would you say, over the years on on how we conduct business in Montpelier and yeah, uh, he was definitely a bridge builder, and uh, but he also had a, you know, he, he lived, right, he lived at the store. I mean, he, right from the very beginning, he lived in the same spot attached to the to the store. So he had his his thumb on what was going on in his community, what was going on in Vermont, all different perspectives. But he, more than anyone else I know, uh, understood uh, what the electric, electorate wanted. And that's what kept him grounded and, uh, and just so practical. So uh, yeah, his, he was listened to um, by, by many who wanted to counsel with him, many, many governors and, and many other senators. So um, again, he was the conscience of the Senate and uh, it'll be an incredible loss for us. Thank you all very much and thank you all.